please welcome the 2014 National Teacher of the Year from Patasco High School and Center for the Arts in Dundalk, Maryland. Your host for this session, Mr. Sean McComb. It's gonna take plenty of money to do it right, child. It's gonna take time. Good morning. Good morning. For the past nine months, I have had the honor to travel the country as a spokesperson for our great profession. From San Diego to Baltimore, from Anchorage to Arizona, and along the way, I have met scores of outstanding teachers who honor our profession by pouring their hearts and souls into making a difference for children. And to their credit, like those of us here, they're always looking to improve their craft. So I get really thoughtful questions about perfecting pedagogy and creating a climate for learning. And then sometimes I get the desperate questions about how to help little ones keep their fingers out of their noses. Or the new teacher who really desperately wanted to know how to have the talk with the seventh grader. Not that talk, but the talk because he was coming back from gym class with a friend, Bo, B-O. And she really wanted to know how she could have an intervention there. She said his right guard had gone and left. And the struggle was real. But there is so much to be proud of in education right now. We have the highest graduation rate in our nation's history. Student achievement on the NAEP continues to climb as the dropout rate continues to fall. And educators are leading exciting work in deeper learning that serves as a beacon for how instruction might evolve in our schools. Kids in Hawaii created scrubbers to remove the volcanic smog from the air in their community. In Massachusetts, students engineered and 3D printed improvements for the wheelchair of a friend. In Indiana, students designed, built, and then delivered filtration systems so that children in Haiti would have clean water to drink. And we are beginning to see the research bear out the efficacy teachers have long known in their hearts for mindfulness practices, social and emotional learning, and teaching the whole child but it's a challenging time to be an educator as well. And teachers are leading the call for more diversity within our profession and more equity within our systems. In 2014, the majority of students in this country qualified for free and reduced meals, and it's the voice of educators who are asking the question that has resonated in hearts and souls for millennia, what are we doing for the least of these? And everywhere, educators work to absorb and adjust to the challenging rate of change within our work. Anytime I start to worry with the pangs of pessimism, I think of the teachers I've met over the past year. These teachers are purposeful practitioners, unheralded heroes who stand at the doors of their classrooms each morning knowing that to students, that's more than a doorway. It's a gateway to opportunity. It's a pathway to make a bright future possible. Nestled in the Black Hills, Ms. Lidzkov helps her students see how they can honor their ambitions of their heart and honor the culture of their tribe. In the plains of the Midwest, Mr. Baxter teaches like a champion pirate with his hair on fire, no single teaching simile able to capture the passion that he has for his students. And in the desert, I stood with Ms. Kelly, and with me, she gazed on at her students and confided in me the strength that she anticipated needing in the coming years when the impending reality for many that the pathway that they took to travel to this country as an infant would mean that their college dreams would have to take a detour. And in the city, Mr. Ford teaches to empower his students so that they can grow to be agents of change in a system still too separate and still too unequal. For these teachers, and for all of us, who champion children within the challenges of our own contexts, our work is as demanding as it is noble. And like those of us here today, these teachers carry out their work with an immutable, humble hope. A belief that through our determined collective efforts, and with God's grace, our schools can be a force to make the world a better place. And I think at this conference, 
as much as any in the country. We know that this won't happen if we don't own it and lead it. I've met teachers from across the country, from small town Oklahoma to downtown New York City, who know that it is our time to lead. That sense is growing, a palpable momentum pulsing through the profession that if we are to get school improvement right for kids, it will be teachers who can, should, and will lead that work forward. And it won't be easy because progress rarely is. From his Birmingham prison cell, Dr. King called on us to recognize that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless effort and persistent work of the people. As much as anywhere in this country, that tireless effort and persistent work toward human progress happens in America's classrooms. Thank you for that work. Thank you for being a part of the solution. It is in our rooms, those foundational blocks of our American democracy, where we make learning come alive. Through experiment and debate, simulation and creation, practice and performance, one lesson, one day, one student at a time, teachers do the personal work that adds into the great work of helping the world look more like it ought to. Our effort to make progress sat central in my mind when President Obama spoke in Selma one week ago. There, at the crossroads of our past and present, he reminded us of the dis distance our collective march had covered and compelled us to carry forward together. And so it is fitting that with this panel today, we look to lessons from our past to inform the work for future generations of Americans. It is now my honor to introduce the keynote speakers and moderator for this session. Most US history teachers and all Civil War buffs know the name James McPherson, American Civil War historian, prolific author, and now retired from the Princeton faculty. While his list of publications is long and distinguished, from a school perspective, the one we know best, and the one that earned him the 1989 Pulitzer Prize is Battle Cry of Freedom. We were lucky, thanks to the help from Tim Bent at Oxford University Press, to get Professor McPherson to join us today. But our good fortune multiplied when we learned that his newest book, The War That Forged a Nation, is being released this week, and we have copies that here that Professor McPherson is willing to sign following the session. The Civil War may have ended 150 years ago, but it continues to have a profound influence on who we are as Americans. But this is the teaching and learning conference where we've all come to expect the unexpected. We not only have Professor McPherson with us, but he will be joined by Martin Luther King III the eldest son of Martin Luther King Jr. A human, a human rights activist in his own right who has a lived experience in civil rights that few could ever know. I was reminded how, of how deep all this runs when I saw Mr. King in the photo on the front page of the Sunday Times as President Obama and thousands of others participated in the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge last week. Mr. King will reflect on Professor McPherson's thesis in a conversation moderated by Professor Chris Edley, a legal expert in civil rights and the former dean of Berkeley Law School. Folks, it doesn't get much better than this. Please join me in welcoming Professor James McPherson, Mr. Martin Luther King III, and the moderator of this session, Professor Chris Edley. I'm not a big believer in throat clearing, uh, and I think uh, we will all be well served uh, if we move immediately to the meat and potatoes uh, of this morning's brunch. So with no further ado, uh, it's really my honor and pleasure uh, to 
ask Professor McPherson to uh, come to the podium and give us his opening remarks on his really terrific new, new book. Thank you, Mr. Adley, and good morning to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I spent all of my life as a teacher. Uh, my parents were also teachers, and so it's a great privilege for me to be here uh, before so many teachers today. The subtitle of my new book is Why the Civil War Still Matters. And the reasons why I think it still matters will provide an introduction to our theme this morning, From Civil War to Civil Rights. To start getting at those reasons, I hope you'll forgive a little autobiography to account for how and why I became interested in the Civil War when I was in graduate school more than half a century ago, because it was for many of the same reasons why the war still matters to us today. Unlike many of my friends and colleagues, I did not have a youthful fascination with the Civil War. When I arrived in Baltimore in 1958 for graduate study at Johns Hopkins, I had not read anything specifically about the Civil War except for a couple of books by Bruce Catton. I had not taken a college course on the Civil War because the small college uh, in Minnesota that I attended did not offer such a course. I had a vague and rather naive interest in the history of the South, in part because having been born in North Dakota and brought up in Minnesota, I found the South exotic, puzzling, mysterious. During my sophomore and junior years in college, Martin Luther King Jr. was leading the Montgomery bus boycott uh, which electrified uh, many of us because of its vision of a better future for black people and white people. During my senior year in college, nine black students integrated Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas under the protection of the United States Army. I was well enough acquainted with history and current events to know that the constitutional basis for these students' presence at Central High was the 14th Amendment, one of the most important products of the Civil War and of the Reconstruction period that followed it. In retrospect, it seems likely that this awareness planted the seeds of my interest in the Civil War era. That seed germinated within days of my arrival at Johns Hopkins, when, like other incoming graduate students, I met with a prospective academic advisor. Mine was Professor C. Van Woodward, the foremost historian of the American South, whose book, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, became almost the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement. My appointment was postponed for a day because Woodward had been called to Washington to testify before a congressional committee about potential prom problems at Little Rock High School, Central High School as a second year of desegregation began. Here, was a revelation, an historian offering counsel on the most important domestic issue of the day. If I had not seen the connection between the Civil War and my own times before that, I certainly discovered it then. That consciousness grew during my four years in Baltimore. The last two of those years included the opening phases of the commemoration of the Civil War centennial. But these events made little impression on me except for an initial episode in Charleston, South Carolina, commemorating the attack on Fort Sumter in April 1961, when a black delegate from New Jersey's Centennial Commission was denied a room at the Francis Marion Hotel in Charleston, where the events were taking place. In protest, several northern delegations walked out of the events, boycotting them until President John F. Kennedy offered the integrated facilities of the Charleston Naval Base. This offer provoked the southern delegates to secede from the National Commission and to hold their own events at the hotel. It all seemed like deja vu. Apart from that incident, the Civil Rights Movement eclipsed the centennial observations during the first half of the 1960s. 
Those were the years of sit-ins and freedom rides in the South, of Southern political leaders vowing what they called massive resistance to national laws and court decisions, of federal marshals and troops trying to protect civil rights demonstrators, of conflict and violence, of the March on Washington in August 1863 when Martin Luther King Jr. stood before the Lincoln Memorial and began his I Have a Dream speech with the words, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been scarred in the flame of withering injustice. Those were also the years of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Selma March, which we have just commemorated in March 18, 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act derived their constitutional basis from the 14th and 15th Amendments adopted a century earlier. The creation of the Freedmen's Bureau by the federal government in 1865 to aid the transition of four million slaves to freedom was the first large-scale intervention by the government in the field of social welfare. It was the parallels between the 1960s and the 1860s and the roots of events in my own time, in events of exactly a century earlier, that propelled me to become an historian of the Civil War and Reconstruction. I became convinced that I could not fully understand the issues and events of my own time unless I learned about their roots in the era of the Civil War. Slavery and its abolition, the conflict between North and South, the struggle between state sovereignty and the federal government, the role of government in social change and social welfare, and resistance to both government and to social welfare. Those issues are as salient and controversial today as they were in the 1960s, not to mention the 1860s. Today, we have an African-American president, which would not have been possible without the civil rights movement of a half century ago, which in turn would not have been possible without the events of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Many of the issues over which the Civil War was fought still resonate today. Matters of race and citizenship, regional rivalries, the relative powers and responsibilities of federal, state, and local governments. The first section of the 14th Amendment, which among other things conferred American citizenship on anyone born in the United States, has become controversial today because of growing concern about illegal immigration. As the great Southern novelist William Faulkner once said, the past is not dead, it is not even past. So let's take a closer look at one important aspect of the Civil War era that is neither dead nor past. No single word better expresses what Americans believe their country has stood for from 1776 right down to the present than the word liberty. In the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, we talk about liberty and justice for all. The tragic irony of the Civil War is that both sides profess to fight for the heritage of liberty bequeathed to them by the Founding Fathers. North and South alike in 1861 wrapped themselves in the mantle of 1776. But each side interpreted that heritage in opposite ways. And at first, neither side included the slaves in the vision of liberty for which they fought. But the slaves did. And by the time of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in 1863, the North also fought not merely for the liberty bequeathed to them by the founders, but also for a new birth of freedom. These multiple and varying meanings of liberty and how they dissolved and reformed in kaleidoscopic patterns during the war provide the central meaning of the war for the American experience. Southern states invoke the example of their forefathers of 1776 who seceded from the British Empire in the name of liberty to govern themselves. 
Southern secession is proclaimed in 1861, the same spirit of freedom and independence that impelled our fathers to the separation from the British government will impel the liberty-loving people of the South to separation from the United States. Jefferson Davis declared that from the high and solemn motive of defending and protecting the rights which our fathers bequeathed to us, let us renew such sacrifices as our fathers made to the holy cause of constitutional liberty. One of the liberties for which Southern whites contended, Lincoln had said sarcastically back in 1854, was the liberty to make slaves of other people. In 1861, many Northerners also ridiculed the Confederacy's profession to be fighting for the same ideals of liberties as their forefathers of 1776. That, said the anti-slavery poet and journalist, William Cullen Bryan, that was a libel on the whole character and conduct of the men of 76. Ignoring the fact that many of the founding fathers owned slaves, Bryant claimed that the founders had fought the revolution to establish the rights of man and principles of universal liberty, while the South in 1861, he said, seceded not in the interest of general humanity, but of a domestic despotism. Their motto is not liberty, but slavery. In 1864, Lincoln, as he often did, used a parable to make an important point. In this case, a point about the multiple meanings of liberty. He did so in a speech at Baltimore, in a slave state that had remained in the Union and was even then engaged in bitter debates about a state constitutional amendment to abolish slavery in Maryland, which narrowly passed later that year, by the way. The world has never had a good definition of the word liberty, and the American people just now are much in want of one, Lincoln said on that occasion. We all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself in the product of his labor, while with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men in the product of other men's labor. Here are two not only different but incompatible things called by the same name, liberty. Lincoln went on to illustrate his point with a parable about animals. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, he said, for which the sheep thanks the shepherd as a liberator, while the wolf denounces him for the same act as the destroyer of liberty, especially as the sheep is a black one. Plainly, the sheep and the wolf are not agreed upon a definition of the word liberty, and precisely the same difference prevails today among us human creatures, even in the North, and all professing to love liberty. Hence, we, we behold the processes by which thousands are daily passing from under the yoke of bondage, hailed by some as the advance of liberty and bewailed by others as the destruction of all liberty. The shepherd in this fable was, of course, Lincoln himself. The black sheep was the slave and the wolf his owner. As commander-in-chief of an army of a million men, Lincoln wielded a great deal of power. And by this stage of the war, that power was being used not only to defeat the Confederacy and preserve the Union, but also to abolish slavery. But traditionally in American ideology, power was seen as the enemy of liberty. Americans had fought their revolution to get free from the power of the British crown. James Madison observed, there is a tendency in all governments to an augmentation of power at the expense of liberty. To curb that tendency, framers of the Constitution devised a series of checks and balances that divided power among the three branches of the national government between the two houses of Congress and between the state and federal governments as, in Madison's words, an essential precaution in favor of liberty. Even that was not enough. In the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the power of the national government and of Congress was further limited by the word, Congress shall not have the power to do thus and so. 
Through most of early American history, those who feared the potential of power to undermine liberty remained eternally vigilant against that threat. When the famous reformer of the treatment of the mentally ill, Dorothea Dix, persuaded Congress to pass a bill granting public lands to the states to subsidize mental hospitals in 1854, President Franklin Pierce vetoed it in the name of preserving liberty. For if Congress could do this, Pierce warned, it has the same power to provide for the indigent who are not insane, and thus the whole world of public beneficence is thrown open to the care and culture of the federal government. This would mean, Pierce continued in his veto message, this would mean all sovereignty vested in an absolute consolidated central power against which the spirit of liberty has so often and in so many countries struggled in vain. The bill for mental hospitals, therefore, would be, he said, the beginning of the end of our blessed inheritance of representative liberty. Pro-slavery Southerners like John C. Calhoun insisted on keeping the national government weak as insurance against a possible anti-slavery majority in Congress at some future time that might try to, to abolish or weaken slavery. State sovereignty or states' rights was a bulwark against this potential anti-slavery majority. The most extreme manifestation of state sovereignty, of course, was secession in the name of the liberty of southern states and southern people to reject the federal government and form their own pro-slavery nation. If that version of liberty was to be used to destroy the United States, most Northerners concluded during the Civil War, then it was time to take another look at the meaning of liberty. To help us understand this change of attitude toward the meaning of liberty with important implications for today, we can turn to the definitions office offered by the famous 20th century British philosopher Isaiah Berlin in an essay titled, Two Concepts of Liberty. The two concepts are negative liberty and positive liberty. The idea of negative liberty is perhaps more familiar to us. It can be defined as the absence of restraint, a freedom from interference by outside authority with individual thought or behavior. Laws requiring automobile passengers to wear seat belts or motorcyclists to wear helmets are, are, under this definition would be to prevent them from enjoying the liberty to choose not to wear seat belts or helmets. Negative liberty, therefore, can be described as freedom from. Positive liberty, by contrast, can best be understood as freedom to. It's not necessarily incompatible with negative liberty, but it has a different focus or emphasis. Freedom of the press is generally viewed as a negative liberty, freedom from interference with what a writer writes or a reader reads. But an illiterate person suffers from a denial of positive liberty. He's unable to enjoy the freedom to write or read whatever he pleases, not because some authority prevents him from doing so, but because he cannot read or write anything. He suffers not the absence of a negative liberty, freedom from, but of a positive liberty, freedom to read and write. The remedy lies not in removal of restraint, but in achievement of the capacity to read and write. The Civil War accomplished an historic shift in American values in the direction of positive liberty. The change from all of those shall nots in the first 10 amendments to the Constitution to the phrase Congress shall have the power to enforce this provision in most of the post-Civil War constitutional amendments is indicative of that shift, especially the 13th Amendment, which liberated four million slaves, and the 14th and 15th, which guaranteed them equal civil and political rights. And in all of those amendments, the final clause is Congress shall have the power to enforce this article. Abraham Lincoln played a crucial role in that historic shift toward positive liberty. Let us return to Lincoln's parable of the shepherd, the wolf, and the black sheep. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, for which the sheep thinks the shepherd is a liberator. 
Here is Lincoln the Shepherd using the power of government and the army to achieve a positive liberty for the sheep. But the wolf was a believer in negative liberty, for to him the shepherd was the destroyer of liberty, especially as the sheep was a black one. Positive liberty is an open-ended concept. It has the capacity to expand toward notions of equity, justice, social welfare, equality of opportunity. For how much liberty does a starving person enjoy except the liberty to starve? How much freedom of the press can exist in a society of illiterate people? How free is a motorcyclist who is paralyzed for life by a head injury that might have been prevented if he had worn a helmet? With the new birth of freedom invoked by Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, he helped move the nation toward an expanded and open-ended concept of positive liberty. On the side of the Union, Lincoln said on another occasion, this war is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start, and a fair chance in the race of life. The tension between negative and positive liberty did not come with an end, to an end with the Civil War, of course. That tension has remained a positive, a, a, a constant in American political and social philosophy. In recent years, with the rise of the Tea Party and other small government or anti-government movements in our politics, there has been a revival of negative liberty. The presidential election of 2012 pitted the concepts of positive and negative liberty against each other more clearly than, any other, than in any other recent election. And that tension, of course, has continued in our politics ever since. How this tension will continue to play out as we approach the end of our sesquicentennial observations of the Civil War and look toward the 150th anniversaries of the events of Reconstruction still remains to be seen. In any case, it's another example of why the Civil War still matters. Years ago, uh, it was remarked that uh, Martin Luther King III had wisdom beyond his years. Well, I, I hate to tell you, but your years have caught up with your, <laughs> with, and I share your pain. <laughs> <laughs> His experience uh, from childhood, and now his experience teaching, leading, inspiring. I really don't know a parallel among folks in his generation. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to ask him to speak to us and share his thoughts and his reactions, and uh, do some inspiring. Okay. Thank you. Let me briefly just uh, say uh, that I'm truly honored to be here today, uh, and certainly to have heard Professor McPherson uh, share a brief critique of a body of work that he uh, has done and perhaps much of what he has experienced through his life. Let me also say that I'm honored to be here, uh, certainly with Professor Edley also, who will moderate our brief discussion. And my comments are going to be relatively brief because um, in a real sense, you as teachers are probably the most important women and men in our society. 
for you set the tone and the part of the foundation for what I believe is our most precious resource. A nation, I believe, is judged by how it treats its most precious resource. Certainly our children are our most precious resource. And our children spend a significant amount, a significant amount of time with each of you throughout the day. What they end up learning becomes a reflection. Yes, it starts at home, but then it also is a reflection of what you impart upon them. Most of us in our lives can state that there was a teacher or two or three that in fact any of us I would say who have some level of success we can say that there was a teacher that inspired us or later on in college a professor or two and so that's why I say you are the most important uh, in our women and men in our society but on the one hand I'm very excited uh, about where we are as a nation but I also am very concerned because our nation appears to be more divided than it certainly should be in 2015 and when we think about what the Civil War was supposed to do certainly my god we've made phenomenal strides but when you look at the fact that part of what the Civil War was fought over had to do with slavery and you look at our criminal system. Now, I didn't say criminal justice system because I'm not clear in my mind that it is a just system. I, I say that because, yes, it works for me. It may work for you, some of you as teachers. But the vast majority of poor and communities of color, kids of commun from communities of color, it does not work for for two reasons, and when you look at the fact that 13% of the population is uh, the jail population is 60, 70, 80%, and yet the African American community represents 13%. The Latino and Hispanic community is growing substantially. It represents a significant part of the prison population now, and also poor people, poor whites who cannot, because we do not have enough indigent defense, I believe, cannot get a fair trial. So that's why I say the system doesn't work. And right, quite frankly, Professor Michelle Alexander talks about the, 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 not so much the new Jim Crow, but, but, but it is the new Jim Crow, because it's really slavery all over again, because people come to jail and are working for less than a cent, one cent an hour. And the prison whole complex has become a business. And so we have re-enslaved people through our criminal system. Over six million black men who have felonies cannot vote. Now, what's interesting about that is they've paid their debt to society. So why is their vote not reinstated? It seems to me that's taxation without representation. With the backdrop of the 50th anniversary of Selma, and just to try to give a brief context, I, I was supposed to give a tribute to my dad, but I didn't, I didn't feel a tribute would be what he would want in 2015, because he and his team worked, number one, to create a consciousness and public policy came from what they did. What do I mean? Well, in 1963, Birmingham was uh, the catalyst. The activities in Birmingham. Dad went to jail in Birmingham. Um, but that whole period was the catalyst for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, Selma, the march from Selma to Montgomery that we just observed just last weekend, was the catalyst for the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that President Johnson signed on August 6th of 1965. In uh, Chicago, 10 days after my father's death, not Chicago, I apologize, but uh, in Washington, uh, 
President Johnson signed the Fair Housing legislation in 1968, about 10 days uh, after Dad's death in April of 1968. Public policy was in order. Everything that my dad and his team did was about creating a policy initiative. Uh, so that in 2015, we may not have some of the challenges. We should theoretically not have them, but we do. Whether it's a Ferguson or whether it's a, um, a, a New York City or whether it's a Wisconsin, it seems like every few days or every few weeks, there's an altercation between police and primarily, not all, but primarily African-American young men who are being killed uh, because there's a breakdown in cultural understandings. Earlier, one thing that the panelists talked about was the cultural understanding. And unfortunately, there's a breakdown in the understanding of who young African-American men uh, are and who uh, police are. And so until we engage in some serious discussion, until we engage in more community policing, until we engage in human relations, diversity, and sensitivity training more and more and more, we are not going to truly address those issues. In fact, I think that we need human relations, diversity, and sensitivity starting in kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Now, you may know that the 50th anniversary of Selma was supposed to observe, and in one sense when we say anniversary, we should be thinking about celebrating. But two years ago, the Voting Rights Act was watered down significantly by the United States Supreme Court, section four and five. And so the Voting Rights Act just really has no real authority right now. The pre-clearance provisions of section five have been totally watered down. Uh, it makes it very difficult and you may say, well, everybody can vote. Yes, uh, you perhaps can, but today we have a new ID that you need to vote. And that is nothing wrong with an ID. I, don't, I think, you know, Fox and others want to make the issue that people don't want to have IDs. People have always had some form of ID for voting. It's just that now there's a new form of ID that's been created. And that form of ID is going to cost resources. And so for students, for seniors, for folks on fixed income, uh, it's a very challenging engagement to get new ID uh, to, to actually be able to go out and vote. I mean, we really need to reform our voting system, and I'm, I promise I'm going to be through in just a second because I think it's important to understand and have some dialogue in terms of questions and answers. But... You know, when we look at our, our voting system, everything today we do electronically. I mean, why can't we uh, register people more online? There are 20 states to do that. More ought to do that. And then you could also register on the same day. And why do we have election on Tuesday? Does anybody know that? I'm not asking. I'm just telling you, most of us don't. Don't know the answer. There's no reason. I mean, if you wanted to throw a party, would you throw it on Tuesday? You want people to participate? No. So why do we vote on Tuesday? Just because. It seems like to me we ought to increase the voting days, the official voting days, and at least have a weekend day or two, maybe three days officially. And then we still could have early voting and all kind of other things to encourage voting. But the reality is the actual election day is not uh, a, the most responsible day uh, for having elections. We need to do that and modify that. The third thing that we can do, I think, that could help the voting process is if we do have to just have another ID, everybody has a social security card. Why not just put a picture on the social security card and then everybody has an official government ID? It's very simple, something that Congress could do tomorrow if they chose to, but obviously they don't want to work collectively. I mean, I, I don't quite understand how we, and I know uh, I'm not trying to foster a political view, but and it's, it's a sad commentary when uh, the president and the administration are working to foster uh, global relationships with a country and Congress decides that it's going to say, well, he's not going to be there but for another year. That's a given. You didn't even have to write that letter. That's, I mean, we know that. Like, duh. 
<laughs> but my only point is, we should never undermine whoever the president is. It, we didn't try to undermine President Bush. We shouldn't try to undermine President Obama and whoever our next president is. The people elected the president to represent us. That doesn't mean he or she is a dictator, but they certainly set the tone. And yes, you should have healthy debate, which Congress is supposed to do. But unfortunately, that stalled. I hope we can get that process moving. That's why I'm suggesting these voting provisions, uh, because um, as I said, when I went to Selma, and in fact, I was in Montgomery yesterday because the organization my father uh, was the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which led the march from Selma to Montgomery 50 years ago. They did a reenactment, so they had started on last Monday, and they arrived in Montgomery yesterday, and so we were able to uh, assemble at the Capitol yesterday uh, in Montgomery once again to reenact. But we are reenacting because we still have not gotten there yet. The final thing I'll say um, is, you know, um, we all have an obligation to bring about change in our society. And as, as I said, you as teachers do this every day in a real sense. Uh, as a kid, I had an opportunity to travel with my mother on many occasions, and one of the times was to her undergraduate institution of Antioch College. And at that college, there was a statue of the educator Horace Mann. And under that statue was an inscription of words that have made an indelible impact upon my life. And what those words say are, be ashamed to die until you've won a victory for humanity. And as I reflected on those words, I said, oh my gosh, that's a very powerful set of words. Be ashamed to die until you've won a victory for humanity. But you know, really, you can win a victory in a number of ways. Some of us will win victories in our neighborhoods. Some will win victories in our schools. Some will win victories in our cities. Some will win victories in our places of worship. Some may win victories in our states and some may win victories in our nation. Others may win victories in our world. But the words basically mean be ashamed to die until you've done a little something to make the world in which we all must live a little better than it was when you arrived. Thank you very much and may God bless each of you always. The plan had been for uh, the three of us to engage in a conversation, but we only have uh, 20 minutes left. So I think in the interest of that, uh, if there are some comments or questions in the audience, uh, I'd like to recognize you. Are there some microphones around somewhere? How is this supposed to work? Yes, there's a microphone. And there's a microphone. All right, so uh, while you're thinking about that, uh, please come to the microphone. Uh, let me make one brief comment. And now I confess that I have the disability of being a lawyer. <laughs> um, or, well, a law professor. Um, and I must say that I'm struck in the conversations right now about education reform, uh, the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, changes to No Child Left Behind. I am struck by how frequently uh, we hear politicians, but not just politicians, probably many people in this room, uh, 
say that the business of education excellence and the business of education equity should be left to the states. And I can't help but think that that's exactly what George Wallace said about <laughs> education and about voting. That the business of who should participate in our democracy should be left to the states. That the business of how to run the schools should be left to the states. So to me, this question of whether we are in fact a union whether there is one nation, uh, whether liberty should mean the same for all Americans, was not at all resolved by the Civil War. When I listen to the debates on education, specifically, it feels to me like we're fighting the Civil War all over again. Mm. And I don't, frankly, understand the ahistoricism of so many people who believe that fairness, equity, can be left to the decision making of 15,000 school boards around the country and the states that have created them, when that's the very system that has given us the conditions of disparity and the absence of liberty that we all know to be so, so poisonously painful. So I'm confused. We're celebrating, uh, we're celebrating the centennial, the sesquicentennial, rather. Uh, but I guess we just don't study history enough. Is that? Uh, I, well, there has always been this tension between uh, state sovereignty and federal sovereignty. It goes right back to the Constitution. Articles, Articles of Confederation, actually. And to the Articles of Confederation. Uh, I think the tendency has certainly been toward greater federal power, but there's resistance to that. Uh, there's an inertia about local control or state control of education, an inertia about local control or state control of a, many, a number of other items, but certainly over time. Uh, the step-by-step -step tendency, maybe two steps forward and one step back, uh, has been for greater federal power, greater federal responsibility. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't like that. Uh, that's the nature, I think, of, of uh, social and political uh, life, is that uh, people have different opinions. Uh, people uh, who, uh, who don't like what's happening are going to organize politically to try to resist it. And I think to, to some degree, the, the uh, stridency of groups like the Tea Party is, uh, is increased by the, 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 the tendencies that they want to resist. So one of the reasons why you get so uh, much protest about uh, edu federal education standards is that some people uh, are going to be hurt by that. Uh, and so they speak out against it. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything necessarily um, unusual about that. That's the nature of political life in a democracy. Yeah. I, just, well, I only want to add one comment, I think, and that is, you know, I think the question is whether we have succeeded or failed. And it depends on who you're talking about, because the goal is for success whether it is from a statewide perspective or a federal perspective. And I think that unfortunately our system has failed for poor people, it has failed for community and for communities of color. So somehow we have to find, and there's been neglect. I mean, we've, when I was growing up, they would not allow you to drop out of school. Now it's almost as if we don't care because we don't understand how to, manage, if that is an appropriate term, our children because there's a cult, cultural competence does not exist. We, I mean, it doesn't mean that someone is bad, they just culturally do not understand 
who, who you are and what, why you come to the table. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, I don't need that. I'll okay. get it later. I'll take so it. They, they, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, I will need it. Back. Oh, you'll need it later. Need okay. Right. Right. But, uh, so I think we've, we've, I think we've got to, that, that's the barometer, the standard that I would use. I would say that we have failed a lot of our children. How do we no longer fail? and include? How do we capture the imagination? You as educators know this better than anyone. Once we capture a child, whomever he or she is, that child is going to want to, want to know more, want to have more. Unfortunately, in a real sense, we live in a society that's dysfunctionally functional. How do you know that? That's an oxymoron, but it's true. The things that some of our children do come from an avenue of dysfunction because it is what is seen in the community. Now, let, let me just say this because one of the greatest unintended contributions of President Obama for those who have said what you need in the African American co uh, community is a two parent home and a, you know, uh, you, you, mm -hmm. which, which is certainly true. I think that's important. We do, that is something that's needed. Now, President Obama. This is not, you don't run for office for this contribution, but you're going to have an entire group of young people who for the last six, seven years have seen an African-American man and woman and children in a functional way, and that's what they're going to aspire to be. They didn't have that example prior to. So this is, this is going to, I guarantee you, that's going to be a huge impact. <laughs> Unintended, but a tremendous impact. So when you have families being able to work together uh, and you have constant love being provided for our children. Love is, is the key. Regardless of where they come from, what's going on, we can love the, love the hell out of them, in a sense. <laughs> okay. uh, over yes, ma'am. My name is Bonnie Bracey Sutton, and I'm a geography and history teacher, STEM too. My question is, we have social media, and so because of that, people should know more about the Civil War. But on social media, it's all made up. It's like the South lost the war but won the peace. Well put. What do you think we can do about that? We're not teaching it in the schools because we're not allowed. Different states, what do we do? Uh, well, I respond to that uh, assertion that the South lost the war but won the peace by saying that uh, the Confederacy's goals in the Civil War were an independent nation and the preservation of slavery. Um, and the peace settlement that came with the surrender at Appomattox and elsewhere uh, ended that. Uh, the South did not become an independent nation and slavery was ended. Uh, the third aim, which really belongs primarily to Reconstruction, but grew out of the Civil War, uh, was um, equal rights for the freed slaves. In that respect, the South eventually did win the peace, but only in, in the respect of, of one out of three of its goals. Uh, it did not win independence, it did not preserve slavery. So I think that uh, you need to qualify this kind of assertion by pointing out that uh, their primary goals, independence and slavery, they lost, and they never got it back. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I'm a um, white special education coordinator, and as a teacher and in my current position, I've always worked with primarily black and Latino boys. Um, and I want to know, what would you recommend to best develop a call for educators to best develop a culturally competent practice and build those skills? Hmm. <laughs> That's a very good question. And I think that um, that would have been appropriate for the last panel. But, <laughs> 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 but I, I, th I think, number one, you know, when you talk about uh, cultural competency, the, there, there perhaps needs to be even a curriculum developed. I don't know that one exists, but maybe there is. Because that is something that needs to be ingested by anyone 
who is teaching other cultures that they have not necessarily experienced and, uh, and may not have understood the plight. We can all, we all have the capacity to empathize with others. But I, I think that, you know, the question for me would be, and, and, and you as educators must research this, and it, it may, there may be a, uh, an, an, actual, um, uh, an, an actual curriculum. That is, that, that's additional to what one would have to do. In fact, probably it should be something that you as teachers go through in general, because we all need to understand every culture. What makes our, our nation uh, wonderful and great is we do have so much diversity. And what creates the challenges is we don't understand the dynamics. We don't understand behavior. Something as simple as uh, African Americans for a long time in corporate America uh, had facial hair because facial hair would protect your, your you know, your, your bumps and all kind of things from shaving sensitive skin. And that was offensive to corporate America. And so those individuals never got promoted. But once it is understood, well, why this is, and of, it, I mean, we should accept the fact that people are just different. And it should be all right, but something about a mustache. I mean, think about it. I mean, the president doesn't have a mustache, right? <laughs> he, I don't know if he could have won if he had a I'm, I'm serious. He'd, he'd look a lot better with a mustache. <laughs> in, so in, in, in my, so uh, I'm just saying, culturally, we've I, got I, a lot I of told work. Him, I told him he'd look better. I, if I he think had you're a right. He, he, yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's all about the, the fears that people have created in their own or, or, or uncomforts. So it's nothing wrong with, with that, it's just difference. We just have to learn, accept difference. So my view is, I, I hope that there's a curriculum that exists uh, that begins that process. There are some uh, that, that, exist, that exist, but uh, let me make the more general point, and that is that uh, the general view, certainly among researchers, but I think also among many teachers, is that a great portion of the billions and billions we spend every year on in-service professional development is not spent well. It's not... And we, we talk a lot now about improving teacher preparation programs. Uh, including with curriculum that will prepare people to teach in, in diverse uh, classrooms. Uh, but we also have to look at professional development investments. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is PD should be giving teachers what teachers need in order to be successful. They should be providing you, and people should be held accountable for making those opportunities available to teachers. So uh, this is one of those areas in which, uh, uh, frankly, I think that unions, uh, hold, there's enormous possibility, I think, uh, for unions to play an even stronger role than they do now uh, in pressing to ensure that, uh, that those kinds of investments uh, are being made. Uh, we're not going to be able to close gaps. We're not going to be able to achieve excellence for each and every child uh, unless we make those kinds of, of, uh, of, of resource allocations. It's essential for the profession and for the future. Sir. Uh, yes, I, I really appreciate the, the conversation this morning. Uh, to me, there, there is something to be said about the intersection between democracy and education. And I think that that's what this is really about. And this notion that was brought up about the freedom from and freedom to uh, talks about the lens on which we interpret those things. And I think in some respects, this tussle, whether it's federal, state, or local, and where the power of the control exists, is not, not a concern, but it's less of a current concern than understanding the why and the unto what that we educate unto a democracy at each of those levels, which I think is forgotten at each of those levels, especially because of the uh, change that we have uh, away from a shared responsibility approach toward a top-down accountability approach, which I think that you see a lot of resistance to. 
So my question is, how do we go about worrying less about the, the thing that seems to come first, about give me the policy that's perfect and then we'll do what's good? And how do we switch this to be about creating the democratic ends and using democratic means by which we flesh out what the public purpose of public education is so we can allow those things to lead. In, in our Constitution, there was a preamble first. It's a lens that says where our priorities are. And for me, whether it's federal policy, state policy, or local policy, why aren't we up front having the discussion, not about what works, because what works under what, but about the public purpose of public education to lift children and having that set the tone for what the policy is that follows. How can we make that discourse happen so that public education and democracy are tied and united once again? We're, uh, we, thank you, we're about to run out of time, so let, let me take the next comment also, uh, next two comments, question. and then we'll, and then we'll respond. It's going to be a question I'm going okay. to start with. What, Brother King, what does your father say to you in the moments where the functional dysfunction and the weight and complexity of the framing that Chris provided or that it's present in all of these beautiful, talented people's questions seems to be too much, right? When you think about the fact that he gave a speech where he talked about wishing for the day when you would be judged based on the content of your character but not by the color of your skin and acknowledging that with all of my privilege, I still know that I have the same chance of being shot in this suit as I do if I were sagging. And so I honor often his sermon, but if not. And for me, that's what I go to, but I just personal point of privilege. When it gets to be too much for you, what does he say to you? That's a great question. All right, last, last comment or question. I feel like as um, educators, we fight every day to win the vi victory for humanity, but sometimes when we come here, it gets overwhelming with what we take in. It's amazing, but it's a lot. What's the one thing you guys would recommend to take back so we can impact change in our community and classroom? Okay. Why don't we, why don't we uh, thank you very much. Why don't, why don't we hear from each of you and, and okay. wrap up? I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Five years ago, I switched professions. I went from accounting to teaching. I work in an urban school. When I switched careers, they told me I was white and I wasn't gonna make a difference and that they weren't gonna let me into their world. I'm like, screw that, right? So this year is my first graduating class. I have two African-American boys. They're my boys. My friend's like, get up there and tell them they're graduating. Why? Because I'm in the hallway hugging them. You know, oh, we're not supposed to hug people. Oh, you know what, no. I hug my boys every single day. I call their house. I go to their house. I love them. And see how I am now? They're like, please don't come to graduation because you're going to be a disaster. I'm going to be on the other side of that stage doing just what I did, which is get up and say, I want to speak. And I'm going to hug them, and I love them. And we need to do more of that. You know, we can talk policy, and we can talk laws. It, it takes us. So two of my boys are graduating. What was in a game? He's not even in a game anymore. I had surgery. I found out he was selling drugs. As soon as I got out of surgery, one of the teachers called me. I called his house. I was still on drugs. I mean, that's what it takes. So thank you so much for listening. I couldn't wait to come here today. And thank you so much for being here. God bless. What? Why don't I have an accountant like that? <laughs> Just go ahead. Why don't you wrap it up? Wrap it up. Well, uh, seems to me one of the themes in this discussion has been the question of success or failure uh, in our social relations, our political relations, and education. Uh, my my way of measuring success or failure is uh, if, the, if the 
glass is one third full and changes take place and it's now two thirds full, but of course it's still one third empty, is that success or failure? I tend to, I guess maybe I'm a naive optimist, I tend to look upon the change from one third full to two thirds full as success, but clearly there's a need for a lot more work. Uh, and until it is absolutely full, uh, there is also a perspective that it's, it's failure. So, uh, and, and that must be a, 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 a way that you measure your impact as a teacher uh, with your students. Uh, clearly, if they're not yet 100% proficient, there's room for improvement. But if they've gone from 40 to 70% proficient, uh, I think you can take some pride in your accomplishment. And I think that's probably true in the history of this country. It's clearly not 100% successful and desirable, but there's been a great deal of change. And much of that change, not all of it, but much of that change has been for the better. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Let me share just two, uh, two closing comments. Number one, we really are the greatest nation, uh, I believe, on the planet. We have the greatest colleges and universities in the world. Uh, we have some very good school systems. But as it relates to our primary and secondary school system, particularly public school system, there are a lot of challenges. I don't believe there's any issue when we put our heads together and create a strategic framework and plan that we cannot resolve. I think my dad and his team showed us that over and over again because they came up against unsurmountable odds and they were very successful because they had a strategic plan. As it relates to our children, there's nothing more important, as you know, as educators, because obviously you. You're not teaching for the money, I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, you think about, we live in a society where you teach children, and those who become gladiators, I don't want to say this in a negative way, but, you know, we pay our athletes more in a year than we pay some teachers in a lifetime. Something is wrong with that. And I, I don't mean to disparage our athletes, I'm just saying that some priorities are mixed up. So we need to find a way to certainly elevate what you make because you are doing outstanding work every day. Um, strategic plan, one of the questions. To me, I don't have that answer, but a strategic framework could answer that question. When you have a strategic plan, follow that strategic plan, you become successful. Final thing, as it relates to what, my, what I hear my dad saying, the, the voice, I go back to one of his uh, sermons in 1955 when, um, you know, first of all, I'm a, obviously come from a family of faith and a man of faith. And of course, I have a, we have a, my wife and I have a daughter that's six years old, first grade. And um, for those of you who don't know this, my mom taught for a few years at Marsh Brown College after she uh, and dad moved back to Atlanta and she graduated from uh, the Boston Conservatory of Music. Uh, so she was a teacher. So. She tried to teach, and I hope I learned a little something from her. But um, my dad, in the sermon in 55, said he'd come home one night about midnight. I was not born at the time, but my younger sister, I mean older sister, excuse me, who unfortunately is deceased today, Yolanda, uh, was. And uh, he came home and picked up the phone, and at midnight, it was midnight, and on that voice, the phone was a voice, an ugly voice, and it basically said, use the N-word, get out of town, and if you don't get out of town, I'm gonna kill your wife and family. We, and of course, Dad, our home was bombed at a later point. And Dad said he didn't, he didn't know what to do. He said it was, I mean, he had heard this all the time. Now, throughout our whole life experience, we experienced that kind of thing on a constant basis. People would call and make threats. But this one, for some reason, he said he couldn't call on his mom or his dad because they were 100, he was in Montgomery, they were about 160 miles away in Atlanta. He couldn't call on his professors. He was drinking coffee and he said he had to get out on his knees and ask God, what should I do? 
He said, I know the cause is right. I know what I think I'm doing is right, but I don't know. And he said that at that voice, he heard the, the voice of God saying to him, stand up, Martin Luther King Jr., stand up for justice, stand up for righteous, stand up for truth, and know that I will be with you even until the end of time. So in a real sense, whenever I go through challenges, those words come in my mind to inspire me. And uh, the little challenges that I go through are nothing compared to what they and others went through and many of our ancestors. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and thank you for what you do each and every day. I want to, I want to thank everybody. Uh, let me close with just a short story. When, when, um, uh, when I was working in, uh, in the Carter White House, uh, responsible for welfare reform, uh, this is back in the late 70s, I was about 12 years old. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, I went with my boss up to the Hill to lobby a conservative, moderate, at the time, uh, Democratic congressman about welfare reform. This is at a time when welfare reform meant spending more money on poor people. Uh, so I went, went up there and my boss and I laid out this great plan that I'd helped put together and it was, was brilliant and I was eloquent. And the congressman said, well, that's, that's all very nice, but I have to tell you, I'm not hearing anything from my constituents about welfare reform. In fact, if they raise the issue at all, they want to know why we're spending so much money on these welfare recipients. Well, I didn't really have any comeback to him because, as I said, I was 12 years old. <laughs> but, but a couple of years later, it came to me what the problem was. It seems to me that after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, the clergy, the faith community, largely took a step back. And a lot of the leadership and energy for the movement was turned over to lawyers and policy wonks. People like me. But it turns out that our deepest disagreements on these issues of justice, liberty, our deepest disagreements ultimately come down to conflicts about values conflicts about moral vision and community. And for most of America, the discussion of value conflicts grows out of their spirituality. That's what people are interested in, ultimately. They're not interested in the policy plumbing, which is what I do. They're interested in the values at stake. In education, I firmly believe that we have a pretty good idea what to do. We really do. And there's no one size fits all, but we know an awful lot about what can make a difference, beginning with elevating the profession. So it's not the policy science where we're wanting. It's in the moral and political commitment to do what we know should be done. It's about the values at stake. So in answer to the question of where we need to go next, it's actually, it's not the kind of thing that I do day in and day out. It's the kind of thing that all of you do when you talk about what you care about, when you talk about the values that are represented by this very profession and it's about bringing a level of passion to the need for change that we really have not seen in decades. But until there is that moral awakening, until there is that moral energy, I fear that we're not gonna get the glass full all the way. And all the way is exactly what each and every one of our children need. I want to thank you for spending time with us this morning, for thinking about history, thinking about its implications 
for today and tomorrow, and I hope you have found something in this to take home to your struggles day in and day out. God bless. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for blessing us with an incredible conversation this morning. I hope that you all feel as I do, like we head back to our classrooms with passion and pride and purpose to carry out this work. Thanks again to our panelists. There will be a book signing right outside of the Carnegie Center and the next concurrent session begins at 11.30. Please join me in thanking them one more time. Thank you all so much.